remembered well. The Greensboro sit-ins that we participated in were one of the later steps on the long and challenging road to desegregation. At this time, many schools and buses were already desegregated due to bravery of events such as the Little Rock Nine and the Montgomery bus boycotters. However, lunch counters and restaurants remained one of the few places left that were still segregated. We decided that this needed to be changed. On February 1st, 1960, me, Easel Blair, and me, Joseph McNeil, and two other college students that we knew, Franklin McCain and David Richmond, all sat at a white food counter until we were served in our attempt to desegregate lunch counters. Although we were abused both physically and mentally, we never retaliated, but we patiently waited. Later that night, student leaders formed the Student Executive Committee for Justice as a result of our actions, which arranged for the sit-ins continue, to continue. This news thrilled us. Maybe, just maybe, we were succeeding. The next day, 27 students joined us at the sit-in. That number doubled a day later. Many people, such as Robert Moses, joined us because of the sullen, angry, and determined look on our faces, as opposed to the defensive, cringing look that he was used to. Several days later, other stores near our original targeted store were experiencing sit-ins as well. Our movement grew in popularity until over 50,000 people in 70 cities participated. As elated as we were, it saddened us to know that not all blacks supported the movement. One black lady, a dishwasher behind the counter on that original day, told us that we were stupid, ignorant, rabble-rousers, and troublemakers. To our delight, the movement was such a nationwide success that the owners of the stores began to lose money. This made them eager to desegregate their stores, and by the end of 1960, more than 80 cities and towns had desegregated stores.